that's, um, I have 10 postcards. Whoever wants them, <laughs> they're yours, okay? For the show next Friday at Turner College, I'm really excited about that. The biggest theater I've performed in so far, it's 150 seats. We have 15 tickets sold, so please come. <laughs> Five remarkable things happened the year I was born. Reagan became elected the 40th president. Lady Di married Prince Charles. Sandra Day O'Connor became the first female Supreme Court justice. MTV was launched. And I was born. I'm told that when I was born, both my brothers held me and I was only as long as their forearms. I've been told this so many times that I almost feel as if I was there. Well, I was there, obviously. I was the baby, but I feel as if I was there, looking at myself, ooing and eyeing, and then I hear something. Oh, it's my parents, they're discussing something. Oh, I know, it's my name. Something pretty, maybe, that will define me and the kind of person I'll be. And then I realize that I have just been named the most difficult name for anyone to pronounce. Ever. So difficult that most Indians don't name their kids what I got named. All of this would have been fine if they had just kept living in India. Among the other Indians who could very easily say and appreciate my name. But no, they decided that my family would move to America. And not just anywhere in America, but to New York City. And not just anywhere in Nueva York. Not anywhere in Queens, where there's a rich, dense population of Indians. No. It wasn't to Queens where we moved, but to the Bronx. Mm -hmm. The good old boogie down, the BX baby, where the two train runs slow and far, where everyone asks, is it safe? When we first moved into our building, everyone was about to retire to Florida, and slowly one by one, all the white people left. And we got Spanish and black neighbors. Teenagers started hanging out in front of the building, drinking and smoking and kissing. Music played louder and louder with sounds of merengue, hip-hop, and reggae pounding through the walls at the same time that my mother listened to the azan and bent her head down to pray. To my parents, none of this mattered. They came to America for a larger purpose, and nothing would take away the pride that they had for their culture. They encouraged us. They wanted us to be the best. So they encouraged me to excel in school. Encouraged. Expected and forced. When I brought home a 98% on a test, my mother would say, Are, but what happened to the other two points? <laughs> 98 is good, but 100 would be better. A man wants to marry a smart girl. And so I studied harder and worked some more, and pretty soon I was getting hundreds on all my tests. I was even helping my teacher score tests and report cards. I became the envy of all the kids in my class. And they showed their appreciation by scaring the hell out of me. <laughs> Catherine and I used to be friends, until I told her I wouldn't give her a hundred on one of her tests. Well, after that, she was always looking for me, and I was always hiding. But whenever I was playing double dutch, she always included herself in the game. I hate coming over here and taking judge from your stupid role. It smells like coffee so bad I want to throw up. You know what? Ben's Harvest Store on Lighting Avenue has the same role for a dollar, so you better go buy it for me today and bring it in tomorrow. You better not mess with me, or I'm going to tell Mrs. Farley, and then you're really going to get it. Don't be stupid, you coolie. Your whole family's stupid, ugly, and stupid, and dumb. Your mama's so dumb, she cooks curry with Old Spice. And then the whistle blew and we all had to go line up. I wrapped up my double dutch rope, coiling it around my elbow and my hand, and I said, my mother's not dumb, yours is. This is one of those moments you play back in slow-mo. Catherine walked right up to my face and I thought, my God, why did I say that about her mother? Everyone knows you can't talk back to a bully. And then I knew she was gonna hit me in front of all these people. So I took a step back with my double dutch rope and I hit her first. I didn't even think about it, I just did it. And then I saw the marks from the rope on her cheek, and I knew I was going to be in big trouble. Mrs. Farley walked over to me. She was a big woman with frizzy blonde hair that desperately needed a touch-up. 
but her lipstick was always perfect. <laughs> Qatar! You hit Catherine with your rope? For no reason? What, have you looked at her face? She's bleeding. Or do you think this is how young ladies are supposed to behave? When I was your age, I didn't go around making fun of people, telling them that they were ugly. I was nice to everyone, no matter what. Nice. But you're always showing off, aren't you? Tell me how your red dots have all this shiny jewelry, but you get a free lunch pass? Use one of those welfare abusing families, huh? My task is going over to you. Always telling people that you're better than them. Well, how would you like it if I hit you in your face for no reason? Is that something that you would like? And before I could respond, I felt it. I felt her hand cross my face and the tears streaming down. And I heard the laughter from the class. I went home and told my mother. Are, in India, teachers hit the children with rulers. I was hit so many times, sometimes for good reason, sometimes not. You don't show that anyone can hurt you. You just Study and work. A man wants to marry a strong girl. <laughs> and at the age of 10, I knew this was about power. I had shifted the controls. So when I entered junior high school, I wanted to transform. I thought about who I could be. And then it came to me. I wanted to be like everyone else. Well, I wanted to be like my Puerto Rican classmates. No, not be like them. Be them. I wanted their gold nameplate necklaces. I wanted their curly hair and nose rings. I wanted parents who would wear tank tops and bathing suits and take me to the beach and teach me how to swim. I wanted a family who would sit outside my building in the summertime and play dominoes and drink beer. I wanted to play music and dance. I wanted to be loud and unapologetic. I wanted to be someone else. And as I sat in the back of my family's car, going over bridges to Staten Island, Long Island, Rockland, to the houses of other Indian families, I imagined myself having another culture. And I thought with that, I'd be free. So when I got my first job by lying about how old I was, working at a small shoe store on Fordham Road, I spent my hard-earned, back-breaking, minimum wage salary on gold. Not the 24 karat gold that my mother wore, but 10 karat gold rings and gold earrings. And when my parents wouldn't let me stay out late or hang out with my friends, we would fight. I, but why can't I go outside? <laughs> All my friends are out there. Go in your it's like 200 degrees in a stupid apartment. <laughs> why you got me locked up in here like a prisoner? I ain't no prisoner, am I? I learned in class that the British kept Indians as captives. That's what you're doing to me right now. <laughs> you are going to compare me to the British? You will have respect for your father. I will send you back to India right now if you don't stop acting like this. In India, you will learn how to be a good Indian girl and a good daughter. We should marry you off as a child bride. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, that kind of scared me. <laughs> well, when I entered high school, I joined the speech and debate team so that I could become other people through characters and plays. And that's when I met Beanie. I was a senior, she was a sophomore, and we decided that we would be partners in a duo category and win together. Tournament after tournament, we brought home trophies. And we became friends. Beanie introduced me to the New York City nightlife scene. Oh my god, this is like so awesome. I always heard about this place, I just didn't know it was going to be so huge. Come on, stop making that face. This music is like so good. Let me show you how to dance to this. You just let your, go of your body, you can do whatever you want. Nobody's watching you, nobody cares what you look like. Oh my god, I can't believe we got into this place. You know, we need to go get those fake IDs, right? The bouncer didn't even ask us how old we were. I don't know why you had to charge us though. Oh, what's $20 when you're in a New York City nightclub? Just pay me back on Monday. <sighs> you see all these people with the lollipops in their mouths? They're on E. 
I know, I know because I went to this club last year with my boyfriend and he gave me some E and I was floating, dancing and floating. Oh, and at one point, I was standing on the top level, right? And I wanted to fly. I really thought that I could just jump off the balcony and start flying around the club. Hey, look at you move. Finally, you're finally like loosening up, Q. I watched her and danced with her, and I felt happy. The music was so loud, it felt like it was coming from inside my chest as if I was producing it, and I... And we just danced all night. When we finally left, our feet were so sore. It was three in the morning, and here we were, just two teenagers walking through the streets of Manhattan to the train. Beanie got off the train before me, and I said, hey, see you Monday. When I got home, the next day, when I got home, there was, I got a phone call from one of my teammates. Hey, Q? Uh, yeah. It's Melissa. Uh, I don't know how to say this. Beanie hung herself this morning. And all I could think about was that I still owed her $20. And I wouldn't be able to give it back to her. The deafening music of the club was still ringing in my ears. She didn't even warn me. I would have said something to stop her. I would have done something to make her smile. I would have. I, I would have. I would have gotten down on my knees and begged her not to leave. I would have slapped her and told her that people are important, that you can't just throw us away. On Monday, it was her funeral. <clears throat> A few months later, angry and jaded, I went to college. I chose a small school far enough that my parents couldn't come and check up on me. I wanted a different environment because the Bronx made me so emotional. I met Alicia and she was from the Bronx too. We were as different as two people could be, but the Bronx swaddled us both, stifling, yet protective. You want me to enunciate? That as an ethnic female, I am constantly reminded in this socio-political realm that perhaps subconsciously, yet pervasively, I am reduced to the other. Even with the escapist mentality that we so thoroughly embrace, with the desire of becoming more than who we are assumed to be, ironically, we exchange the notion of quasi-acceptance from our community to a lowbrow tolerance of what we could be from those who are reluctant to be altered by us. We are left to defend our beliefs of walking through doors of opportunity without hesitancy. We are met with wild eyes and strange wonder. Why here? Why now? Why that? Would not a circumstance closer to those who recognize that we cannot relax suit us better? <sighs> yeah, bartender. I'll take a shot for that. My friends were angry, so I stayed angry. Anger was easy and accessible, love wasn't. I had to remind myself that there was such a thing, that there were some people who would always embrace me. It took me this long to remember my mother in the kitchen cooking dinner for my family. She has unique dishes with flavors that nobody else can conjure up. Shrimp with green pepper curry, lamb curry, chicken korma, curry kitchen, and my favorite, 
shrimp biryani. The way it was made during the Mughal Empire with multiple layers and a presentation suitable for kings and queens. When I was 13, she tried to sweet talk me into cooking with her. Are, but why don't you want to learn? Don't you want to cook for your husband? <laughs> and don't you want to cook for yourself? When I die, who will cook for you? I, then why can't my brothers come and learn with me? Why am I the only one who has to learn? Shoot, I don't want to slave for my husband in the kitchen all day, every day. And I ain't getting married right now. Anyway, Gonyo, I'm 13. You gotta get out of this Indian mindset. We in America now. Besides, my husband is gonna cook for me. Oh, really? <laughs> Cooking is not an Indian thing, okay? You'll see. You'll want to cook and you won't know how and you'll be stuck eating your American burgers and pasta. <laughs> you'll miss your mother's coconut fish curry and shami kebabs. See if you get this at any restaurant or from any man. When I graduated college and came back home after dinner one night, my father wanted to talk. Okay, so now you are done. What are your plans? You don't know. What kind of job will you get with? You don't know, Lady. I told you to study law. You are smart. Why can you not be a lawyer? I said, okay, fine. Don't go to law. You've always done what you wanted. But now you must do what I want. Listen now, this is serious. This last time in India, people were showing up at the house. These Indians, they keep track. They know how old you are. I don't know how they know, but they know. <laughs> and they were saying to me, Bhai Jan, abhi baat to suno, humare paas ek beta hai. And I said, yes, yes. They should email me about their son. And I think to myself, let them email me about their son. And I will pretend I got no email about their son. And this is embarrassing for me. Why should I have to make excuses? You are of the right age now for marriage proposals. Listen now, this is a very big decision. It will be very difficult for you to find someone Indian and Muslim and well-off and everything else. We will find you someone who will put up with your acting, <laughs> smetting, side hobby. <laughs> I don't know about you Americans. We love you, but you do whatever you want. Parents don't matter. We should send you back to India. But he never did. And I didn't know if I wanted to go back there. I thought that if I went, people would, there would be embarrassing me. The thing is, I just wanted to forget what I'd been through. I thought forgetting who I was would make me happy. My friend, Lena, tried to help me forget. She was like a breeze. She went wherever she wanted on her own timing. She was a classical Indian dancer, but she had gigs here and there. Lena, let me remember this. She worked in the garment district. She worked as a babysitter. She even worked in finance as a temp. But she quit that because she said sitting in a chair all day long was giving her wrinkles. If you want to go to India, then go. If you don't want to go to India, then don't go. <laughs> I mean, I, I just don't know what you think you're going to get out of it or what's going to happen there. It's really important, Q, that you realize that you don't have to do anything in life. Live freely, openly. Whatever you do is your choice. Whoever you're with is your choice. If you don't like something about any part of yourself, then change. Make that choice to be different. You can start over if you want. People will notice, and they will embrace it. The point is, it's not about a man. It's not about parents. It's about you, my friend, always has been. It's about love, self-love, worldly love. The point is that you will get exactly from this crazy world exactly what you choose to receive. I've rejected the idea of being Indian and going back to India for so long that I thought, fuck it. I'll go see what the big fuss is all about. I always knew about it as this prison I'd be sent to in my father's threats or as 
this wonderful place where beautiful people would sing and dance in Bollywood style. I knew about it as the slums everyone insisted on showing in the movies, or as the magnificence of the Taj Mahal. <laughs>